How can we make the world better? By making ourselves better. The Dr. Joe Show explores how you can make positive personal change by using his groundbreaking and highly effective I Am approach to understand who we are and why we do what we do. Your small changes can have big effects. Join us now for the Dr. Joe Show with Mark Stiles of Stiles Law, Thomas McCoy, and your host, Dr. Joe Schrand. Oh, welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. <laughs> Very nice. You came right in with it, too. Came in. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go, right. go, go. Go, go. Mark. Go, there go, Mark. Go. Go, Mark. And we started. I went. You did. You marked the spot. It was I great. I went for it. Yeah, I marked it. Very nice. Very nice. You doing okay? Things good? Yeah, how you doing, buddy? I haven't seen you in a while. I know. It's been a while. Well, it's been a week, but um, it's been it's been pretty good. I'm sorry yeah. we didn't get a chance to go for a walk. It was raining. How was it? How was Pan it was Mass? Great. It was great. It was um, it was very rewarding. It was extremely hot and humid mm. and yeah. challenging, but it was... Uh, it was a great weekend overall. It was, uh, they, we raised a tremendous amount of money and uh, created a lot more awareness for what uh, Dana Farber is doing to eradicate cancer. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you helping all those folks with cancer, especially the children mm. and, and the struggles that they have with that. It is such a powerful thing that you're doing. So I appreciate it. And Keep speaking of, of, of helping children, Tom, could you introduce our guest for tonight? Okay. Tonight, Dr. Joe, we got Mr. Ross Melbourne, a lifelong innovator, entrepreneur, and patent holder. He has lived and worked in the U.S. for 30 years, but grew up in England, making stuff for fun. He graduated from North Hertfordshire College of Further Education in the U.K. with an ONC in Business Studies. As a programmer, he has written software for almost every type of computer, from mainframes to iPhones. Ross developed the world's first fully automatic organization charting software. He then co-founded Acquire, an enterprise software company with his wife of 25 years, Lewis Melbourne. Ross is a proven business executive and technology leader using what he calls family-first ethics. He's also the co-author, along with Lewis, of the science fiction novel titled Moral Code, a book that imagines a world where an ethical AI character merges with tiny robot nanites determined to help children in need. Welcome, Welcome Ross Melbourne. Thank you for having me. It is our honor and pleasure. And, you know, I, I've had a chance to, uh, to read through Moral Code. It's just, folks, it's an absolute easy read, a compelling read, a worthwhile read. Uh, and it, it really delves into some pretty profound and timely components of who we are as a human being. So, Ross, first, you know, welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Thank you. How did you get the idea to write Moral Code? Well, it was a, a, a collaboration between my wife and I, Lois Melbourne, um, and, and I, you know, we collaborated in a way where I was basically... Um, providing the technology and kind of the basis for the story. And, um, and she wanted to become a novelist and she'd written two children's books already. Um, and, uh, and the children's books were around helping kids learn about careers. And uh, we, we both um, were in the HR industry. We had a software company we built together and we were successful with that. When we sold it, we decided we would do um, you know, some new, new things in our career. Um, like our second careers, if you will. And um, she wanted to be an author. And um, one day we were talking about what kind of book or um, movie would we write if we, if we could do so. And I had always, I was always coming back to the same um, idea. And that was, in the future, wouldn't it be interesting if robotics and artificial intelligence got so advanced that it could, um, it could help children um, and it could protect children and um, you know from the trauma that so many kids go through and um, she latched on to that idea and said you know could we work on this together I said sure and um, so that's how it was born she wrote the first chapter very quickly 
Um, it was the earthquake scene in the book that people have uh, may have seen the book already, but and and I was just blown away by how good she was as a novelist, um, and um, and so that that started the journey. And she's, you know, she has worked incredibly hard on the book, and I'm very proud of what she's achieved. And um, you know, and I provided the kind of uh, the tech, techno know how um, of, of potentially what could be possible. And we like to think that it's hard science fiction, which means it's um, you know actually could potentially actually come true one day. Um, certainly the AI side, um, I believe, will come true. The robotics, we, um, we'll have to see um, if that's actually physically feasible. Hmm. And just so folks know, AI, for those who don't know, is artificial intelligence. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, sometimes called machine learning. Yeah. It's um, when uh, you, you basically ha have software that can make predictions about the information it's receiving and um and it's it's very widespread um today and um if you've got a smartphone which most people do you're almost certainly using ai every day that's really quite remarkable so why do we call it artificial intelligence well i think it, it all came from the, the the origins of it was that they they figured out how the neurons um in the brain were kind of kind of connected and they um, actually formed a hierarchy um, in the brain, in parts of the brain, where information was stored. And so they thought, could we try and re reproduce this digitally? So they put the neurons together, digital neurons together, right. that formed a kind of hierarchy. And, um, and I think that's when the term you know, artificial intelligence kind of came from. But I'm, I'm not an expert in artificial intelligence. I have, I have dabbled with it. I'm more of a... Um, a programmer that can apply it to different problems, and uh, and I'm actually applying it today on several different projects. Let's let's hear about them if it's not if it's not protected yeah. information. Well, so. Yeah, well, a few of them are protected. Um, um, I've got a, a robotic startup of my own. Um, nothing like the robots in in the book, but I've got my own robotic startup. It's in stealth mode. Um, and it is going to be using artificial intelligence for something quite benign, but, uh, um, you know, very innovative. Um, and um, so, yeah, the, uh, the other one is for another company I'm invested in. And uh, again, a very simple application of when sometimes it's hard to code um, almost what's called fuzzy logic. You can use a neural network to make predictions. But the one I can talk, tell you about in detail is... Um, Ellie Bot. So there's a character in the book um, called Ellie, and she's an artificial intelligence that uh, is a main character in the book. And I said to Lois a few years ago, wouldn't it be interesting if um, we could actually develop a chatbot that um, that people, readers, and journalists, and, and reviewers could could actually you know, you know chat with and talk to, have a conversation with. And at the time. Uh, I came up with that idea. <laughs> I couldn't find the technology that would actually um, do, it, do it justice. And then I was able to, just a, about a year ago, I was able to find a technology that um, was really remarkable uh, by OpenAI. And, um, and so I built a chat bot called EllieBot. And, um, and, you know, all, you know, the people listening and you get you guys more than welcome to uh, uh, reach out to me and, um, and you can have a conversation with her. And it's, um, you know, it's remarkable. She's probably not quite as advanced as the AI in the book. Um, but I think, um, I, think, I think most people will be quite um, stunned, really. It's like you're talking to a person. Wow. That's pretty amazing. So a chat bot. We were off air. We were talking about really why the book is called Moral Code and how that does connect with AI. So... Ross, how yeah, do you know abs code? Absolutely. Why is it called moral code? It's it's called moral code because the um, the the book wonders what will happen in the future when AI is so per pervasive in society. It, we're all, we're all using AI on our cell phones today. Sometimes it recognizes our face to let us in, log us into the phone. Sometimes it's we can talk through it and it translates at what we're saying to text or to another language. So we're using AI every day, but what happens when it's everywhere and it's starting to make decisions for us? Um, and, and we think about AI driving cars and it's got to make 
decisions. Um, but, but really, when you think about turning a ton of decisions over to AI, including medical decisions, um, you know, what is really there to govern it? And I think the thing that um, concerns a lot of people is um, that there's a lot of um, bias that's been shown to, to be true in AI today. And um, and I can I can talk to why that those biases exist, and um, and I, me I mentioned Elibot um, based on a technology by OpenAI, and uh, and it has some flaws, and and those flaws are because it's been trained, um, it's been trained um, with data from the internet, so it's been trained with what the things that humanity says, and as we all know, um, you know if you spend any time on the internet, you can find things which, um, you know, are dark and things which are just not acceptable to most reasonable people. And, um, and so it's really hard for scientists who are building artificial intelligence to, um, to, to make sure the data they're training their AI on is, is kind of not biased against women, against minorities, um, for instance. Um, and so, uh, it, it's it's a challenge, and I can tell you about um, one of my kind of really eye-opening experiences I had when I was building and testing Ellie, the Ellie bot, um, the chat bot, which represents one of the characters in the book. Um, what I was doing was, you know, I was asking Ellie um, questions, um, and, you know, and you, after a while you run out of questions to think about, so I, I asked her um, the things I'm familiar with and some, you know, if, if you ask me any kind of trivia questions, you say, Ross, what trivia subject um, are you good at? <laughs> Which most people may not be. I would probably say really the Apollo missions, the astronauts that went to the moon. Um, you know, I'm, I'm of the age when it had a heavy influence on me as a child. And so I started asking Ellie about the moon missions. And, um, and she, um, she answered them perfectly until one time I asked her about the moon missions and she said, we didn't go to the moon. Wow. And I thought, did I read that correctly? I said, you know, I said to Ellie, but, um, you know, NASA would disagree with you. Um, she said, well, I don't think NASA has all the facts. <laughs> like, um, wow. have you been to the NASA website? She said, I have, but you know, you don't, shouldn't believe things you read on, Oh. And, and and I was just, I was horrified at this. And, um, you know, and uh, to cut a long story short, what's happening there is every every question, and, and it's, uh, you say to Ellie, she doesn't really know what you said before. You have to kind of introduce the conversation every time you speak to her. So it's a little bit like every time I say something to you, the previous 10 minutes of my speech has been forwarded to you and you listen to it very quickly and then you listen to my question. Um, and so what was happening was I, I worded it in such a way that her, in her training, um, she pulled text from in her memory of all these, um, you know, uh, people who didn't believe that we landed on the moon. So before there was fake news, you know, I was, I've been a NASA and Apollo, um, kind of geek for many, many years. And it always puzzled me. And then you can look out there today and, and they, they say about a quarter of Americans don't believe we went to the moon. And so when you have such a large number of people not believing in something that happened, they write about it a lot and they get very excited about writing. So there's a, there's a ton of text out there, which, um, you know, basically is people talking about how the moon missions didn't uh, didn't happen? Of course, you know, people like the MythBusters have have focused on that and shown you um, that all of their 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 thinking is incorrect. You know, the big one was there's no stars in the sky um, because you know basically the sunlight is so bright um, you you just can't see them. Um, it's in daytime, but yet the sky is black and it throws people off. They don't understand that. Um, so that's just one thing that happened, which which kind of horrified me. Um, the other thing I'll tell you is that um, the, the, the OpenAI uh, company, they when you when you use this chatbot, when you use their technology, 
they want you to um, take the answer they give you and then pass it through a filter to make sure it's it's not, um, I guess, uh, just a bad response. And, um, you know, that, that could be racial or some kind of bias. And, and they're trying desperately to filter out these terrible things that are out there on the internet. Um, you know, so to give you an idea, I, I don't know how big the, uh, how much data, but they, they scraped enormous amounts of data off the internet to build this, this neural network. So, and at the time it was the biggest neural network ever built. It's called GPT-3. So there's, there's some, there's some inherent biases and problems with AI today. So I come back to the question of what happens when the world is controlled by AI. Um, when Lois and I talked about it and we, there really needs to be something that protects us from, um, from it making, you know, terrible decisions. That's, that's a powerful, powerful vignette, Ross. So, so Ellie really thought that it didn't exist, that it didn't yeah. happen. Yeah, and then when I deleted the conversation and then um, and then posted the question again, she immediately knew who the command module pilot was for Apollo 11, right. Apollo 12 or 13. She knew all the details. Um, and and you could also ask, you know, compound questions, you know. Um, when, what was the, when did man first sail on the moon and... You know what were their names, and and she can tell you the date and time and the names, and and um, it's 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 actually um, it's really the future of how you know uh, my children and and my grandchildren, you know, won't have to type things out. I think in a Google you know text box, they will just talk and they'll get um, they'll get any answer they need. But it's so interesting because it sort of it sort of helps distinguish between retrieval and integration because. Yeah. The, the information is retrieved, but not integrated into a whole to say, wait, I need to logically look at this particular input compared yeah. to all the rest of it. And that one just doesn't make sense. Am, am I yeah. missing something here? Or? No, you're not missing it at all. And and, and, and really the misnomer is, is um, artificial intelligence. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's, you know, I don't like to use the word fake, but in a way it's fake intelligence. It's kind of pretending to be intelligent. Mm. Um, and and that's where I think that, um, that that's the current state of, you know, the machine learning and neural networks is that it's, it's, it, it just almost fools people. It's getting so good, it's fooling people to think it's intelligent, but but it's really not. It doesn't know what it's talking about. Um, and um, And that's both scary and also reassuring <laughs> that, um, you know, it's not going to take over any day soon. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, it, 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 it only takes in what it's delivered, right? So there's no yeah. logic, there's no reason, there's no, no deductive reasoning and concluding no. and deciding, no. right? It's, it's whatever you put in is what will come out. That's that, yeah. Within the reason, it combines the things you put in, and um, and and it comes up with net new things. Um, and 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 so there's there's also signs of it replacing people's jobs, and certainly some um, you know some journalism can be um, like sports journalism can be written by AI today. You can hand it the facts of what happened in a basketball game, and it can. It can write you an article about it, and um, and we're seeing just recently um, neural networks and AI that can produce images. You ask it to produce, produce me an image of a policeman, you know, on, on an elephant um, crossing a you know a bridge, and it will it'll generate the image for for, for you um, based on all the images it's seen, millions and millions of images. Um, and so that's these are clever tricks, but you know, back to your kind of question mark is it is it reasoning it's not reasoning at all um and that and that's where i think that um a breakthrough needs to happen and um and that's why uh my my kind of pick is jeff hawkins theory thousand brains theory um and i think that um you know which will be much more like the human brain works and and when that happens i think that you know ai will be actually intelligent and reason so there's there's pattern recognition which is part of i think what you're talking about but you would also use the word prediction a little earlier yep. 
Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, it's um, it, what it's doing is um, it's recognizing a pattern and it's predicting what it thinks that pattern is. So a lot of time, a lot of things, um, a lot of the AI um, I've, I've used is around pattern or image recognition or object recognition. So you, you show it um, pictures of cats and dogs and, and it's predicting what that, what's in that picture. And, and it has a, a kind of confidence value of zero to one one being completely confident, it's almost never completely confident, to zero, it's not, it's not a dog. Um, and so um, this is what it's doing. It's, it's basically making predictions. And, and our brain, according to Jeff Hawkins, and I, I think he's right, is we're constantly making predictions about everything. And, um, and it's only when something happens that um, or we listen to or see something that we didn't predict, that our brain kind of fires up, and um, we and we start storing information. It's basically learning. It's how we learn. So the other major difference between the human brain and the current um, technology available for artificial intelligence is that humans continually learn. We have continuous learning, but in artificial intelligence, it's all batch learning. So it's. Um, so Ellie Bot, for instance, was trained in October 2019. Um, and, and so if you ask her anything about 2020 or 2021 or 2022, um, she doesn't know anything about those years. <laughs> um, wow. And uh, so I, uh, you know, so yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that they're trained in batch um, versus continuous. So there's a big difference. The, the current... Um, the current artificial intelligence is 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 limited in lots of ways, but I, I do think there's some applications to help people. Um, you know, one of the ideas I have is to use something like Elibot, but um, pitch it to um, the elderly. And um, and you know, I think loneliness is a major factor in the in the elderly worldwide. And um, I think that in the future, we'll as well as a cell phone or a phone. Um, the elderly will have, you know, a constant companion with them that they can talk to, um, and may be able to remind them of, you know, take medications or certainly, um, you know, kind of be a watching over them, if you will, for their health. Um, but just keeping them company, I think, um, and now, now it sounds a little bit weird, but I, um, I do think that there's an application there. Such a, a fascinating discussion. What? What direction are we heading in with with AI? Is that the direction that they will be our friends? I, I you know, that's um, I I consider myself a, a kind of a would be futurist. Um, I uh, I kind of predicted the the kind of the, the how impactful the World Wide Web would be. Um, I put up our first web server in 1995, wow. um, which is a long time ago, and uh, and I was. I was absolutely I was so excited when I put that web server up and, but then it was constantly explaining to people what the web was and why, you, how you could use it. Um, and, um, and, you know, and I, and I, I was pretty early on in using a lot of technologies, including the kind of modern cell phone. And, and I think that AI is, um, you know, is one of those, technologies that is going to change a lot of things and and, uh, and there's a lot of discussion about how we p- prevent it from doing bad things and that, that's really about the, the book moral code is about you know how do we you know make the world a better place not a worse place um using ai and robotics yeah and, and the idea though that in the book this potential for moral absolutism i mean if if you have an artificial intelligence that is based basing its decisions on pattern recognition and input, and you can still have Ellie Bot say never went to the moon. I mean, <laughs> yeah. How it's it's kind of mind boggling. How do we anticipate what artificial intelligence could do, and how do we? I mean, how do we have it help our world? Yeah. without saying, without having moral judgment, saying that's not right and I'm going to do something to basically eliminate it and erase it from the global database. 
Yeah, I, I think in the, in the book, um, I came up with this um, concept of a moral operating system called Moral OS. And, um, and the Moral OS was, um, you know, kind of like Windows or Mac OS, and it would, it would wrap itself around all the other AIs and neural networks, and it would, it would act as a filter to, um, to say, is that the right decision um, or not? And, um, and, and is it a legal decision? I, one of the things about you know, law is you know, property. Um, so if you have, a, have your own AI or a robot um, and you say, um, you know, drive my car over to somewhere else, it's got to know that's your car. If you ask it to do something, it's got to know that you own that property. So it becomes very um, interesting that you to know the right thing to do. Obviously, we've got these robotic laws of do no harm, um, and, um, and and those are kind of simple in nature and, and and important. But then there's also just you know what 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 can stop an AI, for instance, wiping out your bank account? Um, um, you know that we've got to have some checks and balances in place, and uh, certainly when um, AI is applied to it? robotics. Sorry, Russ, that Say was again? a pun on, on, on wiping out your bank account, so we need some checks <laughs> and balances. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. But but absolutely. Mark, I, I just want to push it over you because you've had some in, you know interaction with artificial intelligence and cars in, in some ways, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I love it. I, I tell my kid who is um, 15 years old that, you know, when he was a I think he was 13. I said, don't worry, you're not going to need to know how to drive because by the time you're old enough to drive, the cars are going to be driving themselves. And I embrace that, right? Because I think personally, there'll be less risk on the road if the computers are in charge versus the human beings. And it's not a popular uh, opinion, but it's mine and, and I'm embracing it fully. But that being said, I'm also a huge elon fan and he talks about reining it in and how long it takes to regulate anything and at this yep. point it's it's too late there's there's no regulating this it's already beyond that is there truth to that do you think um i i, I do think that the pace of innovation is so fast that um, um it's hard for regulations to keep up um, but I, I, I will say that I, I don't think that the current kind of um, machine learning that we have today is sufficient enough um, to to crack the problems of full self-driving. Uh, I have a Tesla, and I've had Teslas for 10 years, and I've got full self-driving on it, and um, I was demonstrating it to my son yesterday, and, um, you know, it's... Uh, I kind of refer to it as a drunk teenager. Mm. Um, you've got to monitor it very t tightly because it's going to do some things that you, you wouldn't expect. So I don't use it very much. And, and I, 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 I just tweeted. I don't tweet much, but I tweeted today somebody very, very smart and that understands the math behind AI. And, and he, he basically had this series of posts which were so detailed about the fundamental reason why full self-driving won't work um, and so, um, so it, it, I think if it, it's a great assistant, um, keeping the, you know, on the freeway, keeping in the lanes, um, it, it does a good job of that. So I think that that'll be, that'll be the case. I think someone's going to crack it eventually. Um, and, uh, but back to your point about, um, you know, not having to drive anymore, I think it's going to happen. Um, it'll probably take longer than people think, um, probably in the next decade. Um, in the 2030s, but um, I think the, uh, the the other thing that will happen is that um, it will be, it'll become too expensive for humans to drive. Um, the, the insurance for humans to drive will be just, only rich people will be able to afford the insurance, I think. Yeah. And so effectively, you know, it'll kind of be the end of humans driving cars. And um, and then the, the, it may even get to the point one day where it's illegal. And I think um, I think Elon Musk has, has, has posted and tweeted tweeted that out that uh, it might become illegal one day for humans to drive. So it's it's going to be in a very interesting world. And and um, but the book the book is trying to imagine um, a, a a very clever lady um, Kira Stetson that um, that solves these problems. And um, but she along the way. 
you know, her passion to help children, um, she realizes that she could help, um, she could help children, she could prevent childhood trauma. And uh, so I think that that to me is the, the, the key reason why it's called Moral Code. So can we get into that without giving away too much of the book? And before that, how do people get the book, Ross? Um, it's a, you can pre-order it on Amazon, for instance. Okay. And um, uh, we actually have a website called um, moralcodethebook.com. And, um, and you can go there and, and there's multiple places you can pre-order the book from. So moralcodethebook.com. And um, you can even you know, sign up um, in the, on the contact page. You can sign up to actually chat with Ellie, the Ellie bot. So uh, if it, people are interested in Ellie bot, um, you know, feel free to you know, reach out to us and, um, and, and we'll, let, we'll, we'll arrange a conversation. With, you, can, you can talk to Ellie. <laughs> so while, while we're working on this, this is exactly part of, of the dilemma that we have is we have all this tech and sometimes, most times, it works in our favor. But every now and then, something happens and we get so befuddled and part of it, I think, has to do with our dependency on it. Yeah. And, and, and part of that, I think, is one of the, the larger concerns about tech in general. And honestly, I think it, it does have to do in some ways with part of the privileged culture that we live in, because not everybody has access to this tech. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the digital divide is a real thing. And um, I think that... Um, <clears throat> I think that um, you know, giving you know equal access to the internet should be almost a human right these days. It's not like access to um, um, access to um, you know clean water and um, electricity. You know, it's it's, almost, it's basically a human right to have that because everyone else has it. So I, I would agree. I think I think we need to. Um, that is one of the problems with with technology is it, it um, you know it, it's not adopted. Um, universally by everyone of every, you know, stratosphere economically. I, I want to I, I come, come back to, to how we apply this to one of the overall um, themes of moral code, which is the idea to how does, how can we help children yep. avoid trauma and protect them against trauma? So while, while we've been a little traumatized by trying to talk with Ellie, we'll <laughs> put that aside for right now. Where where are things with that, Ross? The protecting children from trauma. Well, obviously, the book is um, you know predicting a future or is fantasizing about a future that um, might exist one day. Um, and it just kind of asks the question: What would happen to humanity if we could protect children far better than we do today? And um, you know, I think that. Um, one of the things I, you know, I talked to Lois this afternoon about, um, okay, Lois, you know, if you were on this uh, podcast, you couldn't be on it, but what would you talk about? And um, one of the things she reminded me of was this thing called ACES, and I'm sure um, yeah. the people can understand what that is, and that's you know, adverse adverse child, child experiences. experiences. Yes. And, you know, they did a, a study, um, and, and again, your, your listeners probably know this better than I do, um, you know, and 17,000 adults, and um, there's a direct correlation and, and causation, they believe, between, you know, these traumatic events in, in childhood and and real health consequences. Um, you know, yeah. you're almost three times as likely to die of a heart attack if you've had more than four of these ACE events in your childhood, 12 times as likely to commit suicide. And so, um, you know, the, so if... You know, if you're going to fantasize about a brighter future, um, for me, my, my fantasy would be, you know, could I prevent child abuse? Um, and, and, you know, we're used to superhero movies. Um, and superheroes, people don't notice that superheroes typically save one person at a time, um, which is nice and we like watching that. But, but what if a superhero could um, save everyone everywhere? every time and um and and uh especially those people with children and that that's really what the book is is trying to um it's a picture of the future it's trying to um, paint hmm. well i'm i'm very familiar with aces actually there's 
I don't know if you know about Drug Story Theater, which is my nonprofit, but that was the show that we created during COVID was on ACEs called We're Still Here. And we actually talk about the neuroscience about ACEs and the cortisol response and, and what is actually happening. So I'm delighted and I would be the first in line to say, yeah, let's figure out how to protect kids uh, yeah. from these adverse childhood experiences. Yeah, and I think what we're hoping for is that at least you know, people will start talking about, um, you know, people don't want to talk about child abuse. It's, it's, it makes people uncomfortable, but a lot of topics in the past made people uncomfortable. And, um, and you know, Elias reminded me of, you know, how science fiction and moral code is a science fiction book, but people haven't figured that out yet. But, uh, it, it science fiction has played an important role in, in changing society, I, we believe. And, um, you know, one of my favorites is Star Trek and Lois's favorite too. And it's because it, it, instead of a dystopian future, it imagines a utopian future. And, um, and so if we can get people talking, like Star Trek, for instance, got people talking about, um, you know, different races working together, women working in, in command positions um, and, and being treated equally, these races and, and, and women treat, being treated equally. And, um, and I think they were able to also explore other kind of areas of society by using kind of, you know, aliens from different planets um, to get people to kind of thinking and I think that's really, um, you know, the best you can hope for in, in any kind of, uh, you know, um, fiction is to yeah. is to perhaps perhaps influence people in the right direction. So true. And they changed their opening, you know, from where no man has gone before to where no one has gone before. Yes. So let me. So with that in mind, we're talking a little bit about the I am. You know, there are four domains: the home domain, the social domain, the biological, and the IC. We're always doing the best we can, but because these domains interact, small changes can have big effects. Ross, what small change can you recommend to our listeners based on what we're talking about with moral code? Um, yeah, I think that um, it's not necessarily um, within moral code, but I think it's, um, it's compassion. I think, I think the thing that I had to learn um, pretty late in life is that it's important to show compassion to other people, but it's equally as important to show compassion to yourself. And, and, and when I talk to other people about this, they, they will admit that's something they struggle with. So I would say that's something that um, it's, you know, that, that people could work on and, yeah. and really have compassion for themselves and cut them, as one of my cousins says, cut yourself some slack yeah. and, um, and, uh, and, and basically, you know, have the, the compassion you show to other people, show it to yourself. Right. And that's really what the I am is saying is we're doing the best we can. If you don't like it, yep. you can change it. We've got about yep. 50 seconds left. The second rule, you control no one, you influence everyone. You get to choose the kind of influence you want to be. Ross Melbourne, what kind of influence do you want to be? Um, you know, I that's a good question. And um, I um, mentor some younger entrepreneurs and um, and I try and influence them to, you know, think creatively. Um, and uh, they're typically entrepreneurs, and and um, I think I think it's to um, you know I, I I think get a mentor if you um, having having somebody that's experienced what you've experienced before is always a good idea. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that to influence people that way. Great influence, Ross. Thank you so much, folks. Moral code, get it, read it. It's going to be out in September. We'll see you next week on the Dr. Joe Show. Thanks, everybody.